Welcome to the Downtown Church of Christ worship service. We're glad that you're joining us. Although today we're virtual again, uh, I'll be glad when this is over. I'm sure you will too. Uh, today's text is from Luke chapter 4, verses 31 through 44. If you want to open your Bibles there and turn to that, and we'll be ready for that. As you're watching this morning, this is Easter Sunday. It's the most significant day in Christianity, but actually it's the most significant day in all of human history. Today, uh, we see Easter as a celebration. It's not a celebration of the coming of the Messiah, although it is. It's not a celebration of the teachings of a great philosopher, although it includes that. It's not even the celebration of the death of Jesus on the cross, although that leads to it. It's not even the celebration of the stone being rolled away, although that's the reason why we have hope. Easter is significant because it's the fulfillment of God's promise. Yes, there is a heaven, and yes, there is eternal life waiting for believers, and, and yes, God has power over death itself, and yes, Jesus is, not he was, but he is the one to deliver us from bondage of sin and death, and yes, there's new life for those who are willing to die to themselves and to live for him. Easter's all of that and so much more. We often refer to Easter as Resurrection Sunday because Jesus was raised on that day. That's why we come together on Sundays for service and to worship. If Jesus was raised on a Sunday, what better day to remember that and to celebrate that than on a Sunday? But why every Sunday? People ask that sometimes. Why not only on Easter? After all, if we're celebrating his resurrection, why would we do that every single week? Why not do it just once a year? And it would mean more to us if we came together and did that. We celebrate every Sunday for one simple reason, because we love him, because we love him, and we want to be in his presence. Can you imagine a husband who only visited his wife once a year? Because that's their anniversary. Can you hear him now? Well, honey, you know, uh, it means so much to me to be married to you that I wanted, to, I wanted it to be special. I didn't want to go around all year crowding in on your space and, and telling you I love you. I, I waited till today, and, and I'm dedicating this day to you, and it's a special day for you, and that ought to be good enough. I don't think that would work, but that's exactly the way some Christians treat Easter. There are even jokes among non-Christians about CNE Christians, those that are Christmas and Easter Christ Christians. You know some of them. They live however they want to throughout the year, and suddenly they become celebrative and giving at Christmas and very penitent at Easter time. But as we look at today's text, I think we'll see a different perspective about worshiping God. Bethlehem was the city where Jesus was born, and, and Nazareth was the town that he grew up in. But Capernaum is the town that he seems to call home. He seems to be most at home in Capernaum. Bethlehem with his birth city because that's where his mom and dad were when he was born. And he lived there, oh, somewhere less than two years before they moved to Egypt with him. Nazareth was his boyhood home, but as we studied last week, as we saw the text, they tried to kill him in Nazareth after he preached his sermon there. Our text this morning takes place in Capernaum, and that's where we're going to be at. And as was his custom, we see Jesus in Capernaum on a Sabbath day in the synagogue. It was a full day. In the morning time we see him, he began by teaching God's word. Verses 31 and 32 of our text read as follows. Then he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbaths. And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word was with authority. You know, it's interesting to note that he taught on the Sabbaths. He didn't teach on a Sabbath or on a special Sabbath, but on every Sabbath. This was his normal and customary practice. He was there all the time. He, was, he went about his preaching. Last week, we got a glimpse into his teaching. He taught about life and love. He taught about liberty and light, and he, and he helped people. And it says that people were amazed of his teaching because he taught with authority. You know, there's nothing more authoritative and authentic than someone who lives out what they teach. That's the most authentic you can be. That's the most authoritative you can be. But here on this particular day, something else happens. We continue reading in verse 33. It says, Now in the synagogue there was a man who had a spirit of an unclean demon. And he cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. You know, there's an interesting commentary here as we look at this. 
I've been told all my life by some people that if I just believe in my heart that Jesus is Lord, I'm going to be saved. But this demon that possessed this man believed with all his heart who Jesus was. He even testified that Jesus was the Holy One of God. He knew who Jesus was. He even confessed Jesus. You see, simply believing is not enough. James remind us that even the demons believe and tremble, James 2 and verse 19. And then in the next verse, he tells us that faith without works is dead. Doesn't do any good to believe and not allow that belief to change who we are. Continuing in our text, because something happens here. Verse 35, Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him in their midst, it came out of him and did not hurt him. Then they were all amazed and spoke among themselves, saying, What word is this? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. And the report about him went out into every place in the surrounding region. You know, Jesus shows that he is exactly who the demon said he was by by casting the demon out of the man, commanding the demon to come out. And the people were amazed. They'd seen something special. They had seen something miraculous and supernatural, and they went out and they spread the word everywhere they went. You know, we do the same thing when we see something unusual. We tell people about the wreck we witnessed or about the tornado damage that we saw or about the virus back in 2020 when everybody practiced social distancing while they were looking for toilet paper at every store in town. But this was much bigger. This was supernatural. And so the word spread more rapidly. We'll see the results of that in just a few minutes in our study here. After the synagogue service is over, We see him again as we continue our text, verse 38. He says, Now he arose from the synagogue and entered Simon's house. But Simon's wife's mother was sick with a high fever, and they made a request of him concerning her. So he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she arose and served them. You know, I can't speak for anybody else, but my normal custom after preaching on Sunday is is to eat lunch and take a nap while watching a ball game. You know, I, I miss baseball. I can go to sleep in just a very few minutes when the announcers just drone on and on and on and on and on. Jesus went to Simon Peter's house after services for a meal. There's another side note here. If Peter's wife's mother was sick, then Peter must have had a wife. Yet there are people, and many of them, who teach that Peter was never married. Either they were wrong or Luke is. And I don't think it's Luke. Anyway, as many of us do, these friends got together for a meal after services. When we go out, we often see other families and and sometimes group two or three families together or two or three couples together, and they're they're sitting at any given restaurant you might happen to come to in town. And and sometimes on Sunday evenings after services, the local Wendy's here close to our building is is packed with members from our church. We, we, We fill the place up, and it can get a little noisy there. But wait, that was B.C. That was before Corona. I miss that fellowship, and I can't wait for it to come back, to renew that fellowship. But here we see Jesus doing the same thing. But there's an issue at the house. You see, the mother-in-law was sick with a high fever. I have no doubt they'd been treating it as best they could. They'd probably done some some home remedies. They might have called in a local physician. I I don't know how much or how long she'd had the fever, but, but I'm sure they had done whatever they could to give her comfort and relief. But someone made a request of Jesus. Was that maybe why they invited him home for dinner in the first place? They saw the miracle. They knew who Jesus was. They hoped that maybe he would help. I don't know. But then it says, Jesus rebuked the fever. There's an interesting choice of words there. He rebuked the fever. He didn't didn't say, well, I I wish it would go away. He told the fever to go away. He got onto the fever like you would get onto a a puppy who had had done something you didn't want the puppy to do. And he rebuked the fever. And the fever left her. And she got up to serve him. You know, she didn't get up sick and tired and weak and and grudgingly go around doing the things that she had to do because all these people are in her house. No, she was completely well and refreshed, and she was ready to be a hostess. This was as miraculous as the driving out of the demon earlier that day. I think sometimes we miss parts of these things as we read through them because part of it's more exciting Having a fever go away doesn't seem as exciting, but it's just as miraculous as driving out the demon is. But then came sundown. 
Verse 40 and following here, he says, When the sun was setting, all those that had any who were... Let me restart. When the sun was setting, all those who had any that were sick with various diseases brought them to him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And demons also came out of many, crying out and saying, You are the Christ, the Son of God. And he, rebuking them, did not allow them to speak, for they knew that he was the Christ. You know, again, the demons know who he is. The demons confess that he's the Christ. It takes more than just knowing who Jesus is. We've got to allow Jesus to be the ruler of our life. We've got to submit to his will. It's through that act of obedience. As a matter of fact, the Hebrew writer will even say that he and his obedience allowed for those of us who are obedient to him to find the way to salvation. There's an important lesson there for us as there was for them. The word had gone out from the synagogue and many people came. Can you imagine as they went out into the town and they said, you wouldn't believe what happened in the synagogue today. This man that was there, this Jesus man, he, drew, he drove a demon out of a guy and we saw it with our own eyes. And he's got power from God and he teaches with authority and he, he has this ability to do that. And we've heard about him in other towns and the things that he's done. And they're all excited and they're telling all their friends. So as soon as the sun goes down, the crowd starts showing up. They came from all walks of life, and they had all kinds of diseases, and Jesus healed them all. You know, there, there, there's a reason why they didn't come till sundown, because the Sabbath rules kept them from being able to travel on that day. So they were careful to wait, but they weren't so careful that they didn't get there as soon as they could. He healed everybody. That's kind of an interesting thing there. There weren't any who didn't have enough faith to be healed. Sometimes I see these so-called faith healing services where, where somebody gets healed because they've got faith and somebody else doesn't get healed and it's because they don't have enough faith. It didn't matter. Everybody was healed. It says he healed them all and he didn't practice social distancing either. He laid hands on them. He laid his hands on them as he did that. Some of them were possessed by demons. And the demons themselves testified to who he was, but he stopped them, and, and, and they continued and continued to come, and he continued to heal until they quit coming. It's a part of who our Jesus was. That's a part of the life that he lived among us, that he himself would take on our iniquities, that he himself would stand in for us, that he himself would stand up for us, and that's what he did. Early the next morning, we see him seeking solitude. Verses 42 and following say, When it was day, he departed and went into a deserted place. And the crowd sought him and came to him and tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said to him, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also, because for this purpose I've been sent. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Galilee. You know, they looked for him, but he wasn't where they expected him to be. Even Jesus needed a little quiet time away from the crowds. He needed to recoup his spirit and his strength. He needed to recharge his batteries. But he knew that he had a task in front of him. His task was to preach. His task was to teach. His task was to do exactly what he had said the week before, or in our text from the week before. His task was to go and to preach the gospel to the poor, heal the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind. That was his task. That's why he came. That was his purpose, was to teach people that, hey, guess what? This is important. Anyone can come to God. It doesn't matter what sin you're involved in. You can come to God. Anyone can have your heart mended. You know, it's so hard in the world today to be brokenhearted. If you've got a broken leg, people see that. They may even commiserate with you a little bit. If you've had rotator cuff surgery, as my wife did this last year, and you've got that, that funny little sling thing with the little ball on the end of it, people see that. They know exactly what it is. They notice that. But if your heart's broken, they can't see that. They can't tell that. And so they don't commiserate with you. They don't even understand sometimes brokenheartedness. But Jesus did. He says, proclaim liberty to captives. We talked last week about the Jubilee and the idea that, that every so often you get a fresh start. Every seven years they got a fresh start. Don't you wish sometimes that you could get a fresh start? That's what Jesus offers us is a fresh start. 
and to set at liberty the ones who were oppressed. And we talked about how they were occupied by a Roman army and that the Roman army could demand of them so many different things, but that Jesus was offering them freedom from that, freedom from oppression. Yes, he had that message, and he had to teach it. He had to teach it in other cities as well. And so he set out to do just that. So what do we learn from it? What do we learn from all this? That for Jesus it was important to worship and attend the services every week. Apparently he did that. Not occasionally, but every week. That it was a part of his routine, not just to assemble with the saints, but to fellowship with them away from the building as well. It wasn't just a let's come together and have church. It was let's spend time together outside of the building as well. We learned that we all need to spend a little bit of time alone with God to read his word and recharge our batteries because he's got work that he's prepared for us to do. Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 10. We love 8 and 9. Sometimes we skip 10, but 8 and 9 say, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he has prepared ahead of time, or aforetime, that we should walk in them. You see, he's already prepared works for us. We need our batteries charged so that we can do the works we're supposed to do, just as Jesus went about doing the works that he was supposed to do. And after recharging our batteries, we need to get out and actually do it. That's what the lesson teaches us. Our communion meditation scripture for this week is found in Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. Verses 1 through 7 say, Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened, as they were greatly perplexed about this, that, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then, as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again? And they remembered his words. How wonderful it must be to remember the words of our Savior. Yes, I will die, but yes, I'll be raised again. On this Easter Sunday as we remember the resurrection. Let's not forget the sacrifice that was made so that we might have the hope of life eternal with him.